Read for you by Chiquito Crasto. A Tale of the Ragged Mountains. During the fall of the year 1827, while residing near Charlottesville, Virginia, I casually made the acquaintance of Mr. Augustus Bedloe. This young gentleman was remarkable in every respect, and excited in me a profound interest and curiosity. I found it impossible to comprehend him either in his moral or his physical relations. Of his family I could obtain no satisfactory account. Whence he came I never ascertained. Even about his age, although I called him a young gentleman, there was something which perplexed me in no little degree. He certainly seemed young, and he made a point of speaking about his youth, yet there were moments when I should have had little trouble in imagining him a hundred years of age. But in no regard was he more peculiar than in his personal appearance. He was singularly tall and thin. He stooped much. His limbs were exceedingly long and emaciated. His forehead was broad and low. His complexion was absolutely bloodless. His mouth was large and flexible, and his teeth were more wildly uneven, although sound, than I had ever before seen teeth in a human head. The expression of his smile, however, was by no means unpleasing, as might be supposed, but it had no variation whatsoever. It was one of profound melancholy, of a faceless and unceasing gloom. His eyes were abnormally large, and round like those of a cat. The pupils, too, upon any accession or diminution of light, underwent contraction or dilation, just such as is observed in the feline tribe. In moments of excitement the orbs grew bright to a degree almost inconceivable, seeming to emit luminous rays, not of a reflected, but of an intrinsic luster, as does a candle or the sun. Yet their ordinary condition was so totally vapid, filmy, and dull, as to convey the idea of the eyes of a long interred corpse. These peculiarities of person appeared to cause him much annoyance, and he was continually alluding to them in a sort of half-explanatory, half-apologetic strain, which, when I first heard it, impressed me very painfully. I soon, however, grew accustomed to it, and my uneasiness wore off. It seemed to be his design rather to insinuate than directly to assert that, physically, he had not always been what he was, that a long series of neuralgic attacks had reduced him from a condition of more than usual personal beauty to that which I saw. For many years past he had been attended by a physician named Templeton, an old gentleman, perhaps seventy years of age, whom he had first encountered at Saratoga and from whose attention, while there, he either received or fancied that he received great benefit. The result was that Bedloe, who was wealthy, had made an arrangement with Dr. Templeton, by which the latter, in consideration of a liberal annual allowance, had consented to devote his time and medical experience exclusively to the care of the invalid. Dr. Templeton had been a traveller in his younger days, and at Paris had become a convert, in great measure, to the doctrines of Mesmer. It was altogether by means of magnetic remedies that he had succeeded in alleviating the acute pains of his patient, and this success had very naturally inspired the latter with a certain degree of confidence in the opinions from which the remedies had been educed. The doctor, however, like all enthusiasts, had struggled hard to make a thorough convert of his pupil and finally so far gained his point as to induce the sufferer to submit to numerous experiments by a frequent repetition of these a result had arisen which of late days had become so common as to attract little or no attention but which at the period of which i write had very rarely been known in america i mean to say that between dr templeton and bedloe there had grown up little by little a very distinct and strongly marked rapport or magnetic relation. I am not prepared to assert, however, that this rapport extended beyond the limits of the simple sleep-producing power, but this power itself had attained great intensity. At the first attempt to induce the magnetic somnolency, the mesmerist entirely failed. In the fifth or sixth he succeeded very partially, 
and after long continued effort. Only at the twelfth was the triumph complete. After this, the will of the patient succumbed rapidly to that of the physician, so that, when I first became acquainted with the two, sleep was brought about almost instantaneously by the mere volition of the operator, even when the invalid was unaware of his presence. It is only now, in the year 1845, when similar miracles are witnessed daily by thousands, that I dare venture to record this apparent impossibility as a matter of serious fact. The temperature of Bedlow was, in the highest degree, sensitive, excitable, enthusiastic. His imagination was singularly vigorous and creative, and no doubt it derived additional force from the habitual use of morphine, which he swallowed in great quantity, and without which he would have found it impossible to exist. It was his practice to take a very large dose of it immediately after breakfast, each morning, or rather immediately after a cup of strong coffee, for he ate nothing in the forenoon, and then set forth alone, or attended only by a dog, upon a long ramble among the chain of wild and dreary hills that lie westward and southward of Charlottesville, and are there dignified by the title of the Ragged Mountains. Upon a dim, warm, misty day, toward the close of November, and during the strange interregnum of the seasons which in America is termed the Indian summer, Mr. Bedloe departed as usual for the hills. The day passed, and still he did not return. About eight o'clock at night, having become seriously alarmed at his protracted absence, we were about setting out in search of him, when he unexpectedly made his appearance, in health no worse than usual, and in rather more than ordinary spirits. The account which he gave of his expedition, and of the events which had detained him, was a singular one indeed. You will remember, said he, that it was about nine in the morning when I left Charlottesville. I bent my steps immediately to the mountains, and about ten entered a gorge which was entirely new to me. I followed the windings of this pass with much interest. The scenery which presented itself on all sides, although scarcely entitled to be called grand, had about it an indescribable and to me a delicious aspect of dreary desolation. The solitude seemed absolutely virgin. I could not help believing that the green sods and the grey rocks upon which I trod had been trodden never before by the foot of a human being. So entirely secluded, and in fact inaccessible except through a series of accidents, is the entrance of the ravine, that it is by no means impossible that I was indeed the first adventurer, the very first and sole adventurer who had ever penetrated its recesses. The thick and peculiar mist or smoke which distinguishes the Indian summer, and which now hung heavily over all objects, served no doubt to deepen the vague impressions which these objects created. So dense was this pleasant fog that I could at no time see more than a dozen yards of the path before me. This path was excessively sinuous, and as the sun could not be seen, I soon lost all idea of the direction in which I journeyed. In the meantime, the morphine had its customary effect, that of enduing all the external world with an intensity of interest. In the quivering of a leaf, in the hue of a blade of grass, in the shape of a trefoil, in the humming of a bee, in the gleaming of a dewdrop, in the breathing of the wind, in the faint odours that came from the forest, there came a whole universe of suggestion, a gay and motley train of rhapsodical and immethodical thought. Busied in this, I walked on for several hours, during which the mist deepened around me to so great an extent that at length I was reduced to an absolute groping of the way. And now an indescribable uneasiness possessed me, a species of nervous hesitation and tremor. I feared to tread, lest I should be precipitated into some abyss. I remembered, too, strange stories told about these ragged hills, and of the uncouth and fierce races of men who tenanted their groves and caverns. A thousand vague fancies oppressed and disconcerted me, fancies the more distressing because vague. Very suddenly my attention was arrested by the loud beating of a drum. My amazement was, of course, extreme. A drum in these hills was a thing unknown. I could not have been more surprised at the sound of the trump of the archangel. 
but a new and still more astounding source of interest and perplexity arose there came a wild rattling or jingling sound as if of a bunch of large keys and upon the instant a dusky visaged and half-naked man rushed past me with a shriek he came so close to my person that i felt his hot breath upon my face he bore in one hand an instrument composed of an assemblage of steel rings and shook them vigorously as he ran scarcely had he disappeared in the mist before panting after him with open mouth and glaring eyes there darted a huge beast i could not be mistaken in its character it was a hyena the sight of this monster rather relieved than heightened my terrors for i now made sure that i dreamed and endeavoured to arouse myself to waking consciousness i stepped boldly and briskly forward i rubbed my eyes i called aloud i pinched my limbs a small spring of water presented itself to my view and here stooping i bathed my hands and my head and neck this seemed to dissipate the equivocal sensations which had hitherto annoyed me i arose as i thought a new man and proceeded steadily and complacently on my unknown way at length quite overcome by exertion and by a certain oppressive closeness of the atmosphere i seated myself beneath a tree presently there came a feeble gleam of sunshine and the shadow of the leaves of the tree fell faintly but definitely upon the grass at this shadow i gazed wonderingly for many minutes its character stupefied me with astonishment i looked upward the tree was a palm i now arose hurriedly and in a state of fearful agitation for the fancy that i dreamed would serve me no longer i saw i felt that i had perfect command of my senses and these senses now brought to my soul a world of novel and singular sensation the heat became all at once intolerable a strange odour loaded the breeze a low continuous murmur like that arising from a full but gently flowing river came to my ears intermingled with the peculiar hum of multitudinous human voices while i listened in an extremity of astonishment which i need not attempt to describe a strong and brief gust of wind bore off the incumbent fog as if by the wand of an enchanter i found myself at the foot of a high mountain and looking down into a vast plain through which wound a majestic river on the margin of the river stood an eastern-looking city such as we read of in the arabian tales but of a character even more singular than any there described from my position which was far above the level of the town i could perceive its every nook and corner as if delineated on a map the streets seemed innumerable and crossed each other irregularly in all directions but were rather long winding alleys and streets and absolutely swarmed with inhabitants the houses were wildly picturesque on every hand was a wilderness of balconies of verandas of minarets of shrines and fantastically carved oriels bazaars abounded and in these were displayed rich wares in infinite variety and profusion silks muslins the most dazzled cutlery the most magnificent jewels and gems besides these things were seen on all sides banners and palanquins litters with stately dames close veiled elephants gorgeously caparisoned idols grotesquely hewn drums banners and gongs spears silver and gilded maces and amid the crowd and the clamour and the general intricacy and confusion amid the million of black and yellow men turbaned and robed and of flowing beard there roamed a countless multitude of holy filleted bulls while vast legions of the filthy but sacred ape clambered chattering and shrieking about the cornices of the mosques or clung to the minarets and oriels from the swarming streets to the banks of the river there descended innumerable flights of steps leading to bathing places while the river itself seemed to force a passage with difficulty through the vast fleets of deeply burthened ships that far and wide encountered its surface beyond the limits of the city arose in frequent majestic groups the palm and the cocoa with other gigantic and beard trees of vast age and here and there might be seen a field of rice the thatched hut of a peasant a tank a stray temple a gypsy camp or a solitary graceful maiden taking her way with a pitcher upon her head to the banks of the magnificent river 
You will say now, of course, that I dreamed, but not so. What I saw, what I heard, what I felt, what I thought, had about it nothing of the unmistakable idiosyncrasy of the dream. All was rigorously self-consistent. At first, doubting that I was really awake, I entered into a series of tests, which soon convinced me that I really was. Now, when one dreams, and in the dream suspects that he dreams, the suspicion never fails to confirm itself, and the sleeper is almost immediately aroused. Thus Novalis errs not in saying that we are near waking when we dream, that we dream. Had the vision occurred to me as I describe it, without my suspecting it as a dream, then a dream it might absolutely have been, but occurring as it did, and suspected and tested as it was, I am forced to class it among other phenomena. In this I am not sure that you are wrong, observed Dr. Templeton, but proceed. You arose and descended into the city. I arose, continued Bedlow, regarding the doctor with an air of profound astonishment. I arose, as you say, and descended into the city. On my way I fell in with an immense populace, crowding through every avenue, all in the same direction, and exhibiting in every action the wildest excitement. Very suddenly, and by some inconceivable impulse, I became intensely imbued with personal interest in what was going on. I seemed to feel that I had an important part to play, without exactly understanding what it was. Against the crowd which environed me, however, I experienced a deep sentiment of animosity. I shrank from amid them, and swiftly, by a circuitous path, reached and entered the city. Here all was the wildest tumult and contention. A small party of men, clad in garments half Indian, half European, and officered by gentlemen in a uniformly partly British, were engaged at great odds with the swarming rabble of the alleys. I joined the weaker party, arming myself with the weapons of a fallen officer, and fighting, I knew not whom, with the nervous ferocity of despair. We were soon overpowered by numbers, and driven to seek refuge in a species of kiosk. Here we barricaded ourselves, and for the present were secure. From a loophole near the summit of the kiosk, I perceived a vast crowd in furious agitation, surrounding and assaulting a gay palace that overhung the river. Presently, from an upper window of this place, they descended an effeminate-looking person by means of a string made of the turbans of his attendants. A boat was at hand, in which he escaped to the opposite bank of the river. And now a new object took possession of my soul. I spoke a few hurried but energetic words to my companions, and having succeeded in gaining over a few of them to my purpose, made a frantic sally from the kiosk. We rushed amid the crowd that surrounded it. They retreated, at first, before us. They rallied, fought madly, and retreated again. In the meantime, we were borne far from the kiosk, and became bewildered and entangled among the narrow streets of tall, overhanging houses, into the recesses of which the sun had never been able to shine. The rabble pressed impetuously upon us, harassing us with their spears, and overwhelming us with flights of arrows. These latter were very remarkable, and resembled in some respects to the writhing crease of the Malay. They were made to imitate the body of a creeping serpent, and were long and black with a poisoned barb. One of them struck me upon the right temple. I reeled and fell, and instantaneously a dreadful sickness seized me. I struggled. I gasped. I died. You will hardly persist now, said I, smiling, that the whole of your adventure was not a dream. You are not prepared to maintain that you are dead. When I said these words, I, of course, expected some lively sally from Bedloe in reply. But, to my astonishment, he hesitated, trembled, became fearfully pallid, and remained silent. I looked toward Templeton. He sat erect and rigid in his chair. His teeth chattered and his eyes were starting from their sockets. Proceed, he at length said hoarsely to Bedloe. For many minutes, continued the latter, my sole sentiment, my sole feeling, was that of darkness and non-entity, with the consciousness of death. At length there seemed to pass a violent and sudden shock through my soul, as if of electricity. With it came the sense of elasticity and of light. 
This latter I felt, not saw. In an instant I seemed to rise from the ground. But I had no bodily, no visible, audible, or palpable presence. The crowd had departed. The tumult had ceased. The city was in comparative repose. Beneath me lay my corpse, with the arrow in my temple, the whole head greatly swollen and disfigured. But all these things I felt, not saw. I took interest in nothing. Even the corpse seemed a matter in which I had no concern. Volition I had none, but appeared to be impelled into motion and flitted buoyantly out of the city, retracing the circuitous path by which I had entered it. When I had attained that point of the ravine in the mountains at which I had encountered the hyena, I again experienced a shock as of a galvanic battery, the sense of weight, of volition, of substance returned. I became my original self, and bent my steps eagerly homeward. But for the past had not lost the vividness of the real, and for now, even for an instant, can I compel my understanding to regard it as a dream. Nor was it, said Templeton, with an air of deep solemnity. Yet it would be difficult to say how otherwise it should be termed. Let us suppose only that the soul of the man of today is upon the verge of some stupendous cycle discoveries. Let us content ourselves with this supposition. For the rest, I have some explanation to make. Here is a watercolour drawing, which I should have shown you before, but which an accountable sentiment of horror has hitherto prevented me from showing. We looked at the picture which he presented. I saw nothing in it of an extraordinary character, but its effect upon Bedloe was prodigious. He nearly fainted as he gazed, and yet it was but a miniature portrait a miraculously accurate one, to be sure, of his own very remarkable features. At least this was my thought as I regarded it. "'You will perceive,' said Templeton, "'the date of this picture. It is here, scarcely visible, in this corner, 1780. In this year was the portrait taken. It is the likeness of a dead friend, a Mr. Oldeb to whom I became much attached at Calcutta during the administration of Warren Hastings. I was then only twenty years old. When I first saw you, Mr. Bedloe, at Saratoga, it was the miraculous similarity which existed between yourself and the painting which induced me to accost you, to seek your friendship, and to bring about those arrangements which resulted in my becoming your constant companion. In accompanying this point, I was urged partly, and perhaps principally, by a regretful memory of the deceased, but also, in part, by an uneasy and not altogether horrorless curiosity respecting yourself. In your detail of the vision which presented itself to you amid the hills, you have described with the minutest accuracy the Indian city of Benares upon the Holy River. The riots, the combat, the massacre, were the actual events of the insurrection of the Chaite Singh, which took place in 1780, when Hastings was put in imminent peril of his life. The man escaping by the string of turbans was Chaite Singh himself. The party in the kiosk were sepoys and British officers, headed by Hastings. Of this party I was one, and did all I could to prevent the rash and fatal sally of the officer who fell in the crowded alleys by the poisoned arrow of a Bengali. That officer was my dearest friend. It was old Ed. You will perceive by these manuscripts. Here the speaker produced a notebook, in which several pages appeared to have been freshly written, that, at the very period in which you fancied these things amid the hills, I was engaged in detailing them upon paper here at home. In about a week after this conversation, the following paragraphs appeared in a Charlottesville paper. We have the painful duty of announcing the death of Mr. Augustus Bedloe, a gentleman whose amiable manners and many virtues have long endeared him to the citizens of Charlottesville. Mr. B. for some years past has been subject to neuralgia, which has often threatened to terminate fatally, but this can be regarded only as the mediate cause of his disease. The proximate cause was one of special singularity. In an excursion to the ragged mountains a few days since, a slight cold and fever were contracted attended with great determination of blood to the head. To relieve this, Dr. Templeton resorted to topical bleeding. Leeches were applied to the temples. In a fearfully brief period, the patient died. 
when it appeared that in the jar containing the leeches had been introduced by accident one of the venomous vermicular sanctuaries which are now and then found in the neighbouring ponds. This creature fastened itself upon a small artery in the right temple. Its close resemblance to the medicinal leech caused the mistake to be overlooked until too late. N.B. The poisonous sanctuary of Charlottesville may always be distinguished from the medicinal leech by its blackness, and especially by its writhing or vermicular motions, which very nearly resemble those of a snake. I was speaking with the editor of the paper in question upon the topic of this remarkable accident, when it occurred to me to ask how it happened that the name of the deceased had been given as Bedlow. I presume, I said, you have authority for the spelling, but I have always supposed the name to be written with an E at the end. Authority? No, he replied. It is a mere typographical error. The name is Bedlow with an E all the world over and I never knew it to be spelt otherwise in my life. Then, said I mutteringly, as I turned upon my heel, then indeed has it come to pass that one truth is stranger than any fiction for Bedlow without the E, what is it but old Deb, conversed. And this man tells me that it is a typographical error. End of A Tale of the Ragged Mountains by Edgar Allan Poe Read for you by Chiquito Crasto Birmingham, Alabama.